Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the first of our sector, uh, sector specific sector deep dives for the Industrial Innovation Initiative. Um, I'm Debbie Weil. I'm with the World Resources Institute, and we're really delighted to have an excellent panel uh, today to talk about uh, where we are, where we are now, and where we can go uh, within the steel sector. Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction of our speakers, and then we're going to jump right in. Uh, we are going to start off with uh, these introductions. We'll go through a number of speaker presentations uh, with an overview of the steel sector. We'll look at what some of the decarbonization strategies and technologies look like within the sector, um, and then have the important perspective from labor. Um, and then we'll move into a question and answer session. And then at the end, we'll actually do an update on uh, the economic recovery recommendations from the I3 uh, sort of coalition um, and where we're going from here. We do have a, uh, some time constraints uh, in terms of some of our speakers who have to drop off at the top of the hour. So without further ado, I'm going to do some quick introductions and then we can jump right into the speakers. So our first speaker will be Mike Fowler, who is the Director of Advanced Energy Technology Research of the Clean Air Task Force, where he's responsible for exploring new technologies and related commercial landscapes, facilitating awareness of those technologies with key stakeholders and identifying policy and commercial actions to move them forward. Uh, Mike has spent most of the last two decades working on the costs and benefits of clean energy and environmental systems and also has worked in industry most recently having spent five years with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries on carbon capture and battery energy storage projects. After Mike provides an overview of the steel sector, we'll have two speakers focusing on the decarbonization strategy and technologies for steel. Um, first is Tom Dower, who is the Senior Director of Government Relations for ArcelorMittal, where he coordinates public policy for a range of issues on energy, environment, and climate change, um, from those topics to defense and infrastructure. And he also served for over 15 years as a staff member in the US Senate on both sides of the aisle and was the vice president of the Lighthouse Consulting Group representing energy and environment clients, including the US Climate Action Partnership. Um, joining Tom, we'll have Adam Rardink, who's the vice president for business development at Boston Metal. And Adam has spent the last decade leading global business development for new technologies in the energy industry. Uh, so before Boston, before serving at Boston Metal, Adam also was at Viox Energy, a vanadium flow battery company. Um, and prior to that was the Vice President of Business Development at SustainX, where he led first market partnerships in Korea and Japan. Uh, then following the discussion of strategy and technologies, we'll move to the labor perspective. And for that, we're really excited to have on the line both Martin Williams and Roy Hausman. Uh, Martin Williams is the National Coordinator of State Legislative Affairs for the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers. And he started his career uh, as a field construction boilermaker working in heavy industry facilities, including power plants, oil refineries, and chemical production plants. Martin also served for six years as a business agent and business manager at Boilermakers Local Lodge 13, just north of Philadelphia. And again, joining Martin, we'll have Roy Hausman, who's the Legislative Director with United Steelworkers, overseeing congressional affairs for the union and working to improve the wages, hours, and conditions for United Steelworkers members and their families. Now, he's been a part of the union's legislative and policy department since 2011, having previously served as the Associate Legislative Director and working on a broad array of issues, including tra trade and pension. And before coming to Washington, D.C., he worked at the former Smurfit Stone Paper Mill in Missoula, Montana serving as president of USW Local 885. So with that, without further ado, we're going to jump right into the presentation. So for an overview of the steel sector, I will hand it over to Mike Fowler. Hi, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Debbie. And uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for inviting me to be here today. Um, in the interest of time, uh, why don't we get started, if you can move on to the next slide. All right, so my, my objective here is to give a kind of a brief overview of the, the steel sector, and mostly from the, the emissions side and some of the processes that are going on there that result in the emissions. Um, I included an awful lot of uh, data and citations for further reading, but I'm trying not to cover it all, so make room to, for other discussion and other speakers. If you could advance the slide. So just to put, to put uh, iron and steel in some, in some context for everyone, 
Um, we've got an overview of U.S. industrial greenhouse gas emissions here on the left. And as, as most folks know, you know, industries something like a fifth to a quarter, depending on how you count uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the U.S., you know, sort of on par with, with electricity generation and, and transportation sectors. So uh, a major sector or group of sectors in its own right. Uh, and close to half of those emissions are from uh, five, what I would call key sectors, which are shown on the right here, you know, refining, pulp and paper, chemicals, cement and lime, and, and iron and steel. Um, and those, you know, those five sectors alone, uh, primarily uh, producing sort of bulk materials for other parts of the economy, are, um, you know, 10% of U.S. global, I'm sorry, of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, you know, close to coming up on half of the U.S. industrial. Um, and, you know, the iron and steel is the, is the smallest of those primarily because U.S. is a relatively small piece of um, global steel production, maybe 5% or so of global steel production. So it's not a, you know, there's a lot of steel activity going on outside of the U.S. Our, our sector is relatively small in global, um, global terms. But even, even in, in U.S. terms, the emissions from the iron and steel sector in the United States are more than the state of Massachusetts in total, you know, 70 or 80 million tons per year. So, you know, even, even within the U.S., even though the bar is relatively small, these are a major contributor to the, uh, the overall and more than, as I said, the state of Massachusetts. And, and globally, it's an even bigger, even bigger contribution because of all the activity occurring overseas. Um, the numbers, the percentages vary, but it might be 7%, 8%, or potentially even more of uh, global total CO2 emissions are associated with, with iron and steel. Uh, next slide. So to, to move into this, um, just some simplified terminology and a little bit of background on the sector. You know, there are really three, uh, you can divide it up a lot of different ways, but there are really three primary routes to, to steel production here. Um, and uh, there's some terminology on the left is the, the blast furnace route. So this is, you know, feeding coke, which is derived from coal and, and or some coal directly and iron ore into a blast furnace. Uh, a lot of chemical reactions there occurring. Uh, produces an iron product with a little bit of carbon in it, um, which then is used in a, a basic oxygen furnace um, to produce a, a crude, a liquid crude steel, which then goes on and, and is produced, uh, used in further downstream processes to produce finished products. Uh, as an alternative to that process, there's the, the direct iron reduction route, which um, again uses an iron ore after some preliminary processing steps. And in this case, natural gas instead of the coal, um, produces an iron product again, could be various different forms of that, which would then be used in an electric arc furnace uh, produced to convert it to crude steel, which would then be you know, transformed into products later on downstream. Um, in a complement to that, there's also a recycling or a scrap route, which is pretty important to this whole picture. And again, um, they got a picture here of some uh, ships that are being broken in, um, in Turkey. This was just a picture that was in Reuters last week. This is a major source of, of scrap steel around the world. I'll tell more about scrap in a minute. But scrap can also be used in electric arc furnaces, remelted and converted into crap dust crude steel that's used um, for downstream process. So that's sort of a high level overview on some of the terminology, electric arc furnace, blast furnace, et cetera, that I'll be using in the next slide. Uh, some more detail on those processes here on the left is a really helpful figure from uh, the World Steel Association. Um, but these two, these two primary routes, the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace, and then the electric arc furnace route, um, are, are responsible for about 70% on the blast furnace side of steel globally, 30% uh, up by the electric arc furnace route. And then in the U.S., that's, that's reversed typically. Um, maybe 30% of our steel in the U.S. is from the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace route, and about 70% by the electric arc furnace route. So we use a lot more electric arc furnace steel uh, here in the U.S. Than, than is done on a global basis. Uh, and there's some, some sites down below. Some facts and figures on this just to get folks oriented, folks who are new to the sector or not familiar. Steel, steel is primarily iron. It's almost entirely iron, just a few percent of carbon or other materials, depending on the alloy. Um, and most of the emissions associated with steel are really associated with the iron making uh, stage of the process, some of it directly from the process itself. So as an example of the chemistry here, you know, FeO, that's an oxide of iron. There are a variety of oxides of iron that are, that, are, that are mined in the ore, but you need to convert that to an iron metal before it's useful for steel making. And typically that's done with carbon monoxide that is produced from coke, which is then you know, itself produced from coal. And that results in CO2 directly from that, that chemical process. Um, there's also a lot of, of heating, coking, electricity, and other things that contribute to the overall, the overall emissions picture. 
Uh, globally, we're producing a little less than two gigatons of crude steel each year now. About two thirds of it is from fresh iron metal inputs and about one third of it is from that, that recycling route, the recycled steel that we talked about um, a moment ago. Um, and the emissions vary considerably by these various production processes. So you know, the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace route, you know, might be two tons of CO2 or so, the numbers vary per ton of crude steel. Whereas on this uh, direct iron reduction process using natural gas and then an electric arc furnace, it might be about half that, a, a, ton, of crude, a ton of CO2 per ton of crude steel or, or a little bit more depending on the, the, the carbon intensity of the electricity used in the electric arc furnace process. Uh, if we don't need the, um, in cases where we don't need the fresh iron input, but we're just recycling scrap uh, with an electric arc furnace, you know, the emissions are again, you know, maybe half half a ton or you know a little more than half a ton of CO2 per ton of steel produced. So it's coming it's coming down by that route. And if you were to have you know completely zero carbon electricity uh, using on that scrap and electric arc furnace process, you might be able to get down to you know 100 kilograms of, of CO2 per ton of, of, of steel um, produced. Uh, so that you know as you go down that that, that list of uh, data points there you get to very low numbers you start looking very attractive for sort of greenhouse gas mitigation but there's a there's a major catch in all of this which is that um, the amount of scrap that's available for this recycling process uh, appears to be to be somewhat limited and the definitions of availability and whatnot vary but according to the uh, industry association world steel something like um, 84 percent of the available scrap uh, was actually recycled in, in 2017 and so you know you're sort of, sort of bumping up against the limits of what's available for scrap which limits the amount of um, of this recycling route we can go to even if we had fully uh, decarbonized electricity for that and so we're going to need you know fresh iron uh, input into this mix um, as we go forward now I'll just explain that uh, a little bit on the next slide but before we go just to make the quick point um, this DRI route, this direct iron reduction route uh, using natural gas is actually a growing contributor to, um, to steel supplies globally right now. And there are, is CCS being used on some of those, some of those projects, including one in the Emirates. So uh, as a data point for folks, you know, th there's a lot we can talk about in this space, but we are doing CCS on some of this DRI process now, and we're seeing that process grow over time. So that's, that's good news for, for climate. Uh, next slide. Um, all of that said, you know, fundamentally, um, you know, we expect steel demand is going to grow over the next decades and projections of this vary quite a bit. This, the one on the left here is from a, a report produced by the Stockholm Economics Institute for uh, Climate Works and some other organizations. But you can see that black line trending up from where it is now, you know, a couple, uh, just under two gigatons per year to maybe doubling by the end of the century. Um, and the available scrap to serve that lags and is much smaller than the, than the overall demand. And again, projections on this vary, but even as, even as we get toward the middle of the century, there's still tremendous demand for fresh steel that doesn't appear that it can be met with the, um, the available scrap. And so that, that suggests we're going to need a lot of fresh iron in this mix over the coming decades for, for development around the world. And we need to be looking hard at how do we decarbonize that iron production process, not just the EAF um, sort of recycling, recycling route. And this study is actually pretty interesting. They highlight a number of different approaches to, to reducing that, including materials or circulation. So this is improving the quality of scrap that we can recover, reducing um, contaminants such as copper that get in there. Uh, and just a quick note here that I've got, you know, I say resource shuffling. The point there is that scrap is going to be in demand probably from all over the world. And, you know, to the extent it decarb allows one steel sector to reduce their emissions, fresh iron will be produced somewhere else. So we just need to, on a global basis, need to keep our eye on where's that scrap going and who's getting credit for that compared to who's, who's not able to use that. Um, the Stockholm Institute also emphasizes uh, product materials efficiency. So this is designed for higher strength steels, reducing design margins in buildings, and buildings where you can do that safely, of course, and other things that reduce the overall demand for steel. And then finally, uh, what they were calling circular business models, which is you know, over time, ride sharing, shared co-working spaces, all of these things that kind of result in, result in lower steel demand can bring that top black line down, reduce the amount of, of fresh iron that we might need um, into the mix. Um, but of course, uh, you know, probably not, not remove it entirely. Uh, and so then we're going to need clean, clean iron making technology. And I list four bullet points here, and I think the subsequent speakers are going to get into this, but 
Um, a key one is going to be CCS on blast furnace and related exhaust streams at uh, you know an integrated steel mill. Um, that's you know we've seen some some activity in that space just recently with some uh, feed studies announced and whatnot especially in the US where we have a large existing installed base of that technology um, that could be critically important. Uh, CCS on the natural gas uh, based um, direct iron reduction routes. Um, as I mentioned, Emirates Steel is already doing CCS on that process. Um, there are opportunities to do it differently for different technology vendors, but that's gonna be an interesting one, I think, going forward and an important one. Uh, and then in the long term, you know, the one that the one that I have my eye most closely on, honestly, is the hydrogen-based direct iron reduction. This is direct iron reduction process, but not um, not using natural gas, but using hydrogen directly that's sourced from some external external source. And that one, uh, a lot of people working on that. There are some demonstration projects in development and whatnot that other speakers can get to um, can speak to that I think are going to be quite important and interesting. And then finally, you know direct iron, sorry, direct electricity uses, electrolysis in the sense of for iron reduction. Um, and that's one I don't know nearly as much about personally, but I think some of the other speakers will, will address. So why don't I stop there in the interest of time, uh, skip the last slide and we can, uh, we can move on. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, an excellent overview of, of where, we're, where we are in the iron and steel industry. And if you go to the next slide, we are now gonna move into decarbonization strategies and technologies. So. I will start with Tom Dower from Arcelor Middle, and then uh, and then we'll hear as well from Adam Narajink at Boston Metal. So Tom, over to you. Thanks very much, and, and thanks, Mike. That really was a great overview. Uh, thanks to Great Plains Institute and WRR for putting this series together, inviting us to participate. Um, just quickly, Arcelor Middle is the world's leading steel and mining company with production facilities in 18 countries. We have a diverse footprint from iron ore and coal mining all the way through the steel supply chain from the integrated steel production down to automotive parts. Uh, we also have a strong global footprint of, of scrap recycling and direct reduced iron production, uh, including the electric arc furnaces or the mini mills. Uh, next slide, please. So before diving into the technological pathways to reducing carbon emissions, let me briefly talk about our commitments and targets to put this into context as a company. We fully support the Paris Agreement, and we are committed to helping society meet its goals. We've been operating under a carbon reduction target since 2007. In 2019, we issued our first climate action report, which outlines both the case for continued need for steel production and our approach to reducing emissions, including a call to significantly reduce our emissions by 2050. This summer, we released our Climate Action in Europe report, committing our European operations to a 30% CO2 reduction by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. In these reports, we outlined the technologies that I'll talk about in a moment. Most recently, just last week, we announced that the entire ArcelorMittal Global Group will now strive to achieve the emissions target of net zero. And we expect to publish our second global climate action report by the end of this year with more details. Next slide, please. So Mike already hit upon this, but a key point I wanted to make as well uh, while talking about the future of steel production is that almost all steel scrap currently in the built environment is being recycled at its end of life. Thanks to steel's magnetic properties and endless ability to be recycled, it is the most recycled material on the planet. However, due to rising global demand, primary steel production will remain necessary for decades to come. Therefore, we need to find the technologies that can reduce steel's carbon footprint. Next. Uh, we can move this one quickly. You know, I'm just gonna dive into our strategy and, and really the, the strategies, plural, for low emissions steel making. Next slide. So while there are several technologies that we see as the most promising, we have started talking about uh, them under two headings, smart carbon and in <clears throat> innovative DRI. So really we're talking about the reduction of iron ore, which currently uses carbon as the reductant, thus creating CO2. So developing technologies to make that process as circular and efficient as possible, while also backing out fossil fuels from the front end and creating carbon reducing products from the back end, including products that reduce emissions in other sectors. Concurrently, we're working on transitioning away from carbon to steel making routes backed up by clean power to produce hydrogen, which can be used as a reductant, and direct electrolysis of iron. Okay, next slide. 
So as you can see, uh, we're thinking about the temporal, you know, the timing aspects of the, this challenge by recognizing what we can do now in real time, given what we know currently, while working through the technologies that are either still in development or will require a massive shift in infrastructure at the societal level. Note, for example, that in Europe, one of the first things we can do is, is to increase the use of scrap. As Mike outlined, yet that's not the same case as it is in the US where seven, over 70% of current crude steel production is via the scrap-based DRR route. Next slide. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll quickly get in, into some of the technology routes now. This schematic shows how these pathways relate to each other um, from the clean power in blue on the left to the circular approach in the center and finally carbon capture and storage on the right. Again, this is not just steel making, but really viewing steel plants as broader manufacturing facilities, providing lower carbon steel, carbon neutral cement uh, from steel making slags and through carbon utilization, creating fuels, chemicals, and plastics, putting um, every carbon atom and energy jewel to its best and highest use. Next slide, please. So here are several of the promising technologies that, that we will outline. Uh, in, including bio coal as a feedstock, reformation of waste gases, capture of off gases to convert to advanced biofuel, and carbon capture. So in the next slide, uh, let me just dive into these. So this, uh, this schematic here will show you our Terrero project in Ghent, Belgium. The concept here is to take waste, agricultural, and forestry res residues converting them through a torrefaction process into a bio coal, which we can then use in the iron reducing blast furnace, allowing us to back out fossil fuels like coke and coal. We're, we're also considering other forms of biomass and even waste plastic, which could be one of the missing pieces in the plastic recycling crisis in the world. So this is a fairly straightforward approach um, from the feedstock side. Uh, next slide. So this outlines our Carbolist project, and we're, we're very proud of this project uh, with our U.S. partner, Lanza Tech. And I think I saw Carl Wolf on, um, and many of you also know Laurel Harmon. Um, they're, they're an I3 participant. Uh, Lanza Tech, which is headquartered in Skokie, Illinois, uh, has developed a novel process perfectly geared towards steelmaking, where we will convert blast furnace off gases into a range of projects, products, sorry, starting with bioethanol, with a much lower greenhouse gas footprint than fossil transport fuels. The project in Belgium is under construction and is sized to produce roughly 80 million liters of ethanol annually. This will be Europe's first industrial scale bioethanol plant. Next slide. So the next technology we'll talk about is we call IGAR, which is a project that aims to capture waste CO2 from the blast furnace and convert it using a plasma torch into a syngas for reinjection, allowing us to back out more coal. Again, this process may also lend itself well to plastic feedstocks, so this may hold additional promise. It also requires electricity, so another area where a lower CO2 power grid will be needed for the most carbon reduction. Next. So now we're into carbon capture. Um, we're pursuing a number of, of things, so we're outlining two here. First is the carbon to value project, where we're exploring how to capture carbon monoxide and eventually carbon dioxide streams and convert them into valuable products. Uh, we're working with Dow, another I3 participant, on carbon capture at our Ghent Belgium plant. Uh, and the other project highlighted here is called 3D, meaning DMX demonstration in Dunkirk. Um, this is a consortium, including Total, uh, who is also a participant of I3. I think we're in the right room here. Um, in short, this project involves using a solvent-based carbon capture process, utilizing on-site heat to help cut the energy consumption and resulting carb capture costs. And this is part of the larger effort to develop a future European Dunkirk North Sea cluster, aiming to capture, transport, and store 10 million metric tons of CO2 per year by 2035, again with Total. Next, please. Now quickly, I'll hit upon our, our second technology focus for steel production, which is, is, is a little bit more straightforward, and that's the innovative DRI-based route. Mike already talked about this. Again, this is about replacing carbon as the iron reductant to avoid CO2 emissions. This route must be underpinned ultimately by clean electricity. 
but proving out the technology is important while the shift to clean energy occurs. Uh, so on the next slide, our primary hydrogen project is in Hamburg, Germany, where we're currently operating a direct reduced iron facility as well as an electric arc furnace steel making. With this project, we intend to convert the BRI facility to 100% hydrogen feedstock. The hydrogen will pre be produced from natural gas and waste gases at the plant to demonstrate production of 100,000 metric tons of iron per year. Again, as the clean power options grow, we can more easily move to green hydrogen. Um, and next slide, if there is one. Um, oh yes, my, my favorite two pages of our climate action report. So you don't, don't think you have to read this right now, but if you do go to our website and, and look up the climate action report, this is, these are pages 16 and 17. And it just gives you a good visual of where we see these technologies. Um, there is some time element. They also tell you sort of which TRL level and you know, how, how thoroughly advanced these technologies are and when we think they're really gonna be able to come online commercially. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and look forward to the panel discussion. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, very impressive to hear about these low emissions innovation pathways and also great to hear about all of the collaboration across uh, many of the organizations and companies represented here and in I3. Um, I'll hand it over to Adam Rowding to talk about Boston Metal. Thanks, Debbie. Yeah, and thanks to Mike and Tom. Very nice intro there. Uh, and I especially can play off a lot of the, the material you presented. So uh, you can go ahead and just skip to the next slide. And I'll talk about here, uh, give a background on our technology, where we are in the development. And you know, there's going to be, as Mike and Tom said, a, a very large matrix of solutions put together to, to develop and decarbonize the steel industry. Different stages of, of development, different stages of demonstration. They use different feedstocks, they produce different products. And I'll give a perspective here on where we're at and you know, what feedstocks we can use and what type of product we, we develop. But the process we are developing and commercializing is called molten oxide electrolysis. So it produces, uh, the end product come out of our system is a molten iron, a very pure molten iron product. Uh, and we use electricity directly on iron ore. Um, so as Tom just showed, you can use electricity to do electrolysis on water to get hydrogen. Uh, we're doing that same electrolysis, but doing it directly on iron ore and doing that at high temperature. So the result is a uh, the product that comes out is a very high purity iron. Uh, and the byproduct, since there's no carbon in this equation anymore, is oxygen. And that's a picture of it in the bottom left. Uh, there are a facility outside of Boston tapping metal from our development system that we're operating today and in the process of continuing to scale up. And that's what we see as the future is, you know, clean steel being produced. You can do it right in Boston like we are today because the emissions from the process would be, would be oxygen in this, in this sense. So if you go forward one. Uh, and just very briefly on how the process works. So as I mentioned, uh, oxide feedstocks, uh, one of the, the key things here, and I'll reinforce this on the next slide, is that it doesn't require sintering or pelletizing. So we can use iron ores in a very raw form as fines or lumps. Uh, everything is going to be molten in the process. So no mechanical properties of the ore are required like you would in a blast furnace. We mix that in our process with other more stable oxides to make an electrolyte. That oxide, those oxides are calcia, magnesia, alumina, silica, things that are found naturally in iron ore anyway. Uh, and as you pass electricity through our process, it's a DC process, um, which I, I might add looks very similar to how you do aluminum production today. It's an electrolysis process, different materials, different temperatures, but the, the core of the process borrows heavily from aluminum. Uh, but as you pass electricity through our process, uh, it heats everything. It's operating at around 1600 degrees Celsius, molten iron temperatures. The oxide that's reduced is the iron ore. Split that into iron and oxygen. The molten iron collects at the bottom of the pool in red on this diagram, and the oxygen is the byproduct. All of the rest of that uh, silica and alumina that comes in with the iron ore stays in the electrolyte. Um, this process runs continuously. You know, the cell comes online for years. You tap metal, you tap electrolyte. Uh, and you have that controllability of, of the process. And if you go forward one, in a similar slide, a little bit modified from what uh, I believe Mike showed or Tom, uh, but this is where we fit in the production process. So taking fines or lump ore directly into the process, no, no need for pelletizing or sintering, uh, using adding electricity to the process and out comes a molten iron product. So it's not, um, 
some people try to think of it similar to pig iron, which would come out of a blast furnace. That's not the case. It is, you know, it's further downstream because it is pure, pure iron. You'd have to add carbon after the process as an, as an alloying step. Um, but it can be used directly to replace, you know, an integrated steel, or it can be added to, to an EAF, just like you would DRI. Um, potentially could add that hot as a molten product uh, to help dilute out some of the contaminants and scrap. Um, so it has, it has portions both on the integrated steel side and on the mini mill. But what we produce is a molten, a very high purity molten, molten iron. Next slide. And it, at its core, as I said, electrolysis has been used for aluminum production. It is a platform technology in that we can use a wide variety of different oxide feedstocks and make different uh, end products. Our primary focus as a company is steel, very much is steel. That is by far the largest opportunity to go after. Uh, but in parallel, as we go to steel, we are doing some first markets in ferro alloys. Uh, we announced one earlier this year, a customer in Brazil, a mine in Brazil, CBMM, that owns 80% of the market for the metal niobium, uh, which is an alloying element that goes into different high strength high strength steels. Uh, we have a piece of hardware uh, at the port in Brazil right now, uh, trying to get that through imports in a COVID world, but that's, that's going to be commissioned later this year. And one of the things that really ties that back into steel and where we fit in the steel industry is that one of the, one of the benefits that we can provide to CBMM and that we're working to prove out over the next year is a very strong selectivity in the process, meaning that we can put in a fairly complex feedstock, a mixed feedstock, and, and as a result, get a high purity molten iron product. And if you go to the next slide, when you look at where we fit in the steel sector, one of the opportunities there is to use a very wide array of iron ores and feed them as feedstocks into our process. So again, they can be come in as fines or lumps. You don't have to pelletize those. But we can use, and this is a chart just taken from one of the ore producers, Fortescue, uh, a quite wide array of iron ore grades um, and, and different impurity levels. And as we, as we continue the development of the process, it's really understanding you know, how far can we stretch that, stretch that box. Um, technically, we can do all of them. It just becomes an economic uh, question to how, you know, how much of impurities or how low of a grade of iron you can handle. Uh, but from the work we've done thus far, we think there's an opportunity to feed 58 grade ores, 62 grade ores uh, directly into our process and produce a very high purity uh, molten metal. You know, if you look at um, just, you know, some contrasting there, if you look at some of the DRI processes, for example, you typically need, you know, as they're produced today, a very high grade ore. You need some of the 66, 67 type grade ores. Um, so we think here, you know, where we can fit in is, is being able to utilize some of those lower grade ores uh, and get a high quality molten, molten product out of the, out of the process. Uh, next slide. And just a quick uh, glimpse here at uh, production costs and economics of the process. I mean, the big question here is you're replacing coal with electricity, you know, and what type of electricity prices do you need to get to before this can start to be competitive without, without carbon taxes. We use about four megawatt hours of electricity per ton of crude steel that's produced. That's the energy to, to heat everything, to do the reduction of the iron oxide and all the losses associated with the engineered system. At those numbers, if you look at really 30 to $40 per megawatt hour in terms of electricity pricing, we think we can be very competitive. And this just looks at over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, if you take coal and iron ore and scrap, the different raw materials, what's your raw material cost to produce a ton of steel with the incumbent integrated approach and where do we think we can fit in uh, and so as we develop the system, you know, that's kind of the, the economics we see as, as possible as we, can, as we scale up the process. But you are going to require an, an abundant source of electricity. You want that to be clean electricity. Um, you know, if this is coal-fired power, it, it makes very little difference. You just shifted the emissions somewhere else. Uh, but at $30 to $40 per megawatt hour, we think this process could compete uh, directly with the, with the incumbents at a very similar production cost. And there might be one more slide. Yeah, and just finally, uh, in closing, you know, we're not doing this alone. Uh, I joined the company about three years ago. We are a venture capital backed startup. We were eight people at the time. Today we're closer to 50. Um, some very strong investors from a diverse set, venture capital funds, the Bill Gates Fund, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, OGCI, which is backed by 12 or 13 of the big oil majors, uh, and then a number of industrial partners as well, helping us bring this to market, borrowing you know, best practices wherever we can, uh, examples being somebody like RHI Magnesita for refractory or prime metals technologies for all of the, the balance of plant and integration, um, as well as CBMM and the Department of Energy. So thank you.
Thanks very much, Adam. Uh, really exciting to hear about the, the technology opportunities for decarbonization. Um, uh, we're going to shift now to the labor perspective. Uh, first, hearing from Martin Williams with the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers, and then from Roy Hausman with the United Steelworkers. And um, I hope that folks are also getting questions ready um, as we'll shift over after this to a uh, question and answer session. Um, so, Martin, over to you. All right, thank you. So, um, uh, good morning, everyone. As mentioned, my my name is Martin Williams. I'm the National Coordinator of State Legislative Affairs for uh, the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers. Um, you know, thank you to everyone at Great Plains for uh, the invitation to participate uh, uh, participate in today's webinar, um, which has been really insightful so far, um, and one that I'm glad to be a part of. Since uh, we have been very strong advocates for carbon capture for uh, over 10 years, um, we know that widespread deployment of carbon capture. Uh, in multiple sectors is going to be necessary to uh, address climate change and, and, and will also create a lot of jobs along the way. Uh, broadly speaking, the reason why we're so invested in carbon capture you know, beyond its, its necessity and uh, as, a, as a practical tool for addressing climate change is uh, because it's a technology that uh, will allow us to easily apply our training and our skill set uh, to its development and expansion. Uh, most of the capture systems uh, in use now, and many that are being explored, uh, involve multiple pressure vessels and, in the process flow, such as reactors, uh, absorbers, heat exchangers, and, and will require uh, highly skilled labor to install the equipment and maintain it. Um, let's face it, despite the use of uh, some highly uh, corrosive resistant alloys and, and coatings in today's pressure vessels, uh, vessels at the heart of carbon capture systems will experience wear and will require maintenance. Uh, for, for boilermakers and other craft, uh, maintenance work opportunities are as important as new construction opportunities. And uh, to successfully sustain a career as a construction boilermaker means completing one project assignment after another. Uh, we also know from experience uh, how many jobs are possible with the, the build out of CCS. And, and for us, the two best examples are uh, are probably the, the Boundary Dam project in Saskatchewan and the uh, NWR Sturgeon Refinery in Alberta. Uh, combined, both projects required thousands of boilermakers to complete and represented uh, significant milestones uh, in the demonstration of, of CCS and the, the power and refining sectors. Uh, more generally, boilermakers have greatly benefited from the installation of uh, environmental control systems uh, over the last 20 years, our members have worked millions of, of man hours installing equipment uh, to reduce power plant pollution and allow uh, refineries to produce cleaner fuels with, with less energy. Uh, you know, so part of the pitch of participating in today's webinar was to uh, reflect on last year's uh, Great Plains delegation to the, to the UAE and Belgium and the Netherlands. And I was uh, very happy to be a part of that delegation uh, to get a firsthand look at uh, carbon capture in the steel industry. And I was also happy to be part of a delegation with so many smart and talented people. Um, as a former construction boilermaker, I thought I knew about steel, but uh, that trip really opened up my eyes. Um, but uh, re reflecting on last year's trip, I had a few takeaways. Uh, and I don't, uh, don't want to spend a lot of time uh, repeating what, uh, what's been said, but the, the main takeaway for me was seeing uh, what was possible with the right incentive uh, and each facility we visited symbolized that, um, you know, whether to supply uh, capture CO2 to nearby oil fields for enhanced oil recovery or, you know, carbon footprint, uh, footprint reduction motivated by an emissions trading system. Uh, and uh, on that note, I'll say that the, the, the tour of the Lantatec project site at the uh, Arcelor model again mill was probably the most fascinating and and, and coolest part of the trip for me, and not just because of the, the four large reactors at the, at, at the center of the process. Uh, it, uh, I felt that project in, embodied the innovation and versatility of approach uh, of carbon capture in, in addressing climate change. Uh, a second takeaway was, was recognizing the policy bottlenecks uh, in advancing carbon capture. A uh, big part of the discussions that our delegation had centered on effectively transporting captured carbon and possibly linking uh, 
uh, other industrial facilities to uh, a large scale pipeline network. Uh, single point demonstrations of, of carbon capture are helpful and encouraging, but uh, as everyone on the call knows, to advance, uh, you know, to, or I should say, to achieve national and global decarbonization goals in the industrial sector means uh, utilizing a, a transport uh, infrastructure capable of moving large amounts of CO2 to market you know, or to suitable geological formations for, uh, for storage. Uh, not all facilities are gonna be con conveniently located near uh, an oil or gas field or, or formation suitable for long-term storage. Uh, you know, policies that will uh, incent investment in uh, CO2 pipeline construction will also provide uh, an, an additional incentive for facility owners looking to uh, invest in carbon capture since transportation will be a, a shared cost. And a, a lot of progress has been made, continues to be made, and uh, still have a way to go. Um, back to the, 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 the Lanza Tech project, it, it also highlights the obstacles faced in advancing a similar project in the U.S. Under the, under the renewable fuel standard, uh, production of ethanol from uh, approved methods generates uh, RINs credits for which, um, you know, which can be sold to refiners to satisfy their obligations under the standard. Uh, but the uh, the, the process uh, to be employed by uh, Lanza Tech at the, at the steel mill won't generate RINs under the renewable fuel standard because it's not a, an approved pathway. Uh, that's not to say a, a, a project like that in the U.S. is impossible, but uh, production of RINs is an important financial incentive. Um, and as we all realize, we need more incentives to advance carbon capture, uh, not less. Um, also, since discussion of, of hydrogen as a strategy for decarbonizing steel and other industries is increasing, um, you know, that's an area that holds a lot of promise for boilermakers. Uh, embracing this method will require uh, lots of hydrogen, and then the question becomes how to produce it. Um, one, one suggestion we support is coupling nuclear power with hydrogen production. Uh, nuclear power is an important source of man hours for boilermakers, and uh, Unfortunately, we've seen a shift in the, in the power sector where nuclear power's uh, future is uncertain in the face of competition from other sources uh, to the point where some plants are either shutting down or, or require state assistance to remain operational. Uh, hydrogen production uh, by nuclear power would provide nuclear power plants an additional revenue source, uh, provide industry with the volume of hydrogen needed and, and maintain the viability of existing facilities uh, or promote the construction of, of new reactors leading to increased work opportunities for portal makers. Uh, so uh, I, I think the main point I wanna make is that uh, as the use of carbon capture technology expands in the steel industry, uh, the opportunities for boiler makers multiplies. Uh, the, the vessels needed for a carbon capture system hopefully will be sourced from fabrication shops employing boiler makers. Uh, boilermakers will be needed to install those vessels at the mill. Uh, boilermakers will be needed to maintain those vessels. Uh, carbon capture for enhanced ore recovery keeps our domestic refineries operational uh, and keeps our members working. Uh, similarly, uh, use of electric guard furnaces or, or expanded use of electrolysis uh, will uh, keep electricity demand up and, and will need to be supplied by reliable sources of power. Uh, hopefully uh, nuclear or fossil fuel plants with carbon capture applied. Um, and you know, as we all discussed the possibility of a, a circular carbon economy, that applies to labor also. You know, every step along the way, we can use our, use our resources in a responsible way and, and put people to work. Um, it's the win-win it's the that we often reference and it can be done. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Martin, for those insights and reflections and the importance of carbon capture as a technology here as well. Um, we'll turn it over to Roy Hausman for the labor perspective from United Steelworkers. Roy? Great. Thank you, Debbie. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to, to have a conversation with you all. Uh, my name is Roy Hausman, Legislative Director for USW. Um, I want to thank Great Plains and World Resources Institute for this forum and the opportunity to participate in the Industrial uh, Innovation Initiative. Um, from, you know, United Steelworkers is the largest uh, union uh, in steelmaking in North America. Uh, we, rep we represent roughly, to give an example, 40% of domestic flat rolled steel uh, here in the U.S. Um, for membership. 
and uh, we're throughout the entire supply chain of um, steel making uh, from the uh, iron ore mines in Minnesota um, to you know final finishing and can can production uh, you know uh, canning production uh, in the Midwest so our ability um, our membership is uh, pretty broad and deep within the operations and maintenance of um, steel making on a regular basis so you know our you know this USW has seen this commitment um, to you know, reducing emissions in the steel sector and industrial sector primarily as a as a primary goal in a few in a, in a for a, a few reasons one is um, as was seen in uh, the slides earlier you know since 22 percent of emissions uh, in the US are coming from the industrial sector low, many segments of the um, labor movement, the, particularly the steel workers, uh, work in those segments, refining, steel, cement, all of these areas, we, we play a vital role um, in ensuring that those products are uh, delivered day to day, day in, day out. And so we've been thinking of a critical long-term maintenance for those, for those family sustaining jobs. And, you know, to give you a sense, um, you know, at uh, steel making facilities, um, you know, one of our, you know, our major employers, uh, typically, you know, with benefits, you see a rough salary range of just a low six figure of about 100,000. And so, you know, those sorts of, you know, wages in the Midwest are extremely, um, you know, powerful. Um, they create a great tax base and expand, you know, and create an opportunity for, for workers to, you know, create, you know, move up and be part of that, um, you know, class. Um, you know, over the last 20, 25 years, we have seen this dramatic change in the steel industry in, in the United States. Um, and I think as been referenced earlier, you know, you're seeing this change in technology and the USW wants to be at the forefront of those sorts of changes in technology, while at the same time recognizing that there's an opportunity here to ensure that those jobs that are related to it um, uh, expand and grow. Um, we look at, for example, on the, uh, historically, we've seen a lot of technological advancement that may not necessarily lead to um, job growth. And we've also seen this area of um, import penetration impact the you know, capability of a, um, existing facilities to upgrade and create um, you know, the next generations of steel and the next generations of um, you know, emissions reductions technology. And then also um, just overall capacity overhang uh, in the steel industry um, writ large globally has created concerns um, and almost creating this issue of um, basically a valley of death. Um, and while we've seen you know, some great presentations, um, Tom did some wonderful work here showing some of the examples that are advancing technology in Europe, a lot of that technology has yet to really be deployed here in the US in, in, a, in a critical manner. And there's going to be a fine line here of finding that ability to ensure that there's enough domestic um, demand and supply um, for domestic sources to create that infrastructure investment in our steel steel making facilities in the U.S. And so, you know, it's going to be a mix of policy um, and market solutions that are really going to find it. Um, you know, ensure that there's long-term viability for the U.S. domestic steel industry. Um, which has seen import penetration as high as 30% not that long ago. And even today, with all of the measures that have been taken by the current administration, import penetration is still um, at the, in the 17 to 20% range. Um, so for domestic steelmakers, it's going to be a question of how we get this reinvestment, we get the policy recommendations right to move these um, technological advancements over the long term, and then ultimately, how is labor going to capture that? Um, um, uh, some of the gains that provide that are provided through not only the reduced emissions and better environment, but um, advanced steel making that will provide the um, technological advancement for the next generation. And so, you know, our I think one of the things that we've considered quite a bit um, is that the you know, is this area of global competition. Um, just this last week, um, the OECD um, forum announced uh, that, you know, with the COVID-19 crisis, 
um, you've seen a um, expansion of um, uh, overcapacity uh, reaching up to 700 million metric tons. And that uh, is going to actually impact quite a bit of the ability for, um, for work, you know, for uh, industrial innovation and in capability for next generation of production. So containing this overcapacity is something that we're going to have to work on over, over time. And I'll link to the um, OECD's um, steel chair statement um, from uh, in the chat function to give you everyone a, a sense of that um, and to, to for the raise the concerns there. Um, and so you have this, ex, uh, this overcapacity issue that's still looming and it's going to impact the industry over the long term. And so the market policy based decisions related to that is something that we're going to really have to look at. So in the US, one of the major functions has been 232 tariffs. Um, those tariffs have been a somewhat of a blood instrument, but they have increased steel pricing, um, allowing for recapitalization and, uh, and continued employment in a number of facilities. Um, and while we can look at Europe, um, you know, as a number of examples for future green steel projects and uh, the potential for border measures, um, it's going to require an, a significant investment in our own uh, congressional delegations and policymakers, um, and that's going to take an investment of by our membership, um, an investment by our membership to to encourage those right policy and emissions discussions, and in a way that's going to ensure long term employment. And so I think you know really that's where we want to spend a lot of our energy and time, and we look forward to kind of working on some of these next um, these future technologies and our members providing the uh, manpower to ensure that those uh, technologies deploy and um, produce the next generations of steels. Um, so um, I keep it short and uh, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Roy, for those important considerations and reflections. And I'm, I think we're all uh, impressed and stunned with how much information we just heard from all of these speakers. I'm going to hand this over now to Brad Crabtree at Great Plains Institute for moderating the question and answer session. Climate crisis is a crisis for humanity, but we can be the generation that solves uh, the challenge of the climate crisis. And the question is, how do we do that? The world needs steel. Our societies are built with it, but there is one problem. Today, our industry accounts for approximately 7% of all the CO2 emissions in the world. Our plan is to have the first of our steel mills without CO2 emissions in 2025. We will then be able to deliver fossil-free steel to the market. To reach the climate goals, a breakthrough technology needs to be developed. Hybrid is uh, an initiative that we started a few years back to challenge this uh, iron-making technology that has been used since a very long time, which today creates a lot of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. We have uh, an ambition in Sweden to become the first fossil-free welfare nation in the world. And that is a very clear ambition. Hybrid is, of course, a clear step towards that ambition. It is important for, for the surrounding world to see it is uh, possible. This is a new giant step. We are a collaboration between SSAB, LKB and Vattenfall. And this is a, a unique collaboration. What we want to do is to use electricity that is uh, fossil free and producing hydrogen and using hydrogen for iron ore reduction. And in that way, we can get rid of the root cause for carbon dioxide emission from the steel industry. Uh, climate change is here and requires immediate action. It's a brave decision to launch this uh, quite extensive uh, research and development program that is hybrid. The stakeholders involved in a hybrid LKB, SSAB and Vattenfall, we have of course different backgrounds, different skills and different goals, but we have one common goal, to create a value chain from mine to fossil-free steel. 
we have done uh, a lot of uh, research work since we started this uh, initiative and now the most important step is the development work that we will do in the pilot facility because this is a key step in the technical uh, scaling up. We are super close to operations now. As you all know, we have had the challenges with the corona, with the supplies being slightly delayed. We have huge challenges and those processes do take time and that's time that we don't have uh, for us to meet the, the ambitious time plan of, of having fossil free steel by 2026 and becoming first in the world with this. So uh, we have a time plan challenge and it requires that everyone cooperates for this to happen. In the end of the day, there are a lot of uh, legal things, uh, regulations and all kinds of things which has to be changed and we need to speed up the processes and that is uh, maybe the most difficult part. Time is running so we are uh, working very hard to get things uh, in place. A couple of years ago it was more or less seen as a crazy idea and, and now you see more and more other steel companies and, and iron making companies uh, talking about hydrogen as an obvious solution. So, so already now I would say that we've had an impact globally on, on defining the solution for, for the steel industry. And, and, and the steel industry being one of the biggest emitters of CO2 in the world, it's just very fulfilling and it's, it's exciting.